Good morning, brothers. I feel it's a, a privilege uh, to share with you a few things on our community life. Of course, uh, I'm not going to share anything new, but just to recall or remind ourselves of the wonderful gift that we have in our own communities and how we can further build up our community life and strengthen the bond that we may have between one another. <clears throat> we as brothers are called to build bridges. Yes, there were two brothers, blood brothers, and of course uh, they had a wonderful relationship, but something happened in between. So they had a misunderstanding and the brothers were angry with one another. And it so happened, they had their own houses. And one of the brothers wanted to construct a wall between the houses. So he called the masons, the workmen, and entrusted their work to them. And he said, build as high as possible, like eight feet height, so that I need not see his family, any of the members of his family. I don't want to see at all. I don't want to have the sight of that family. I hate them, he said. So he entrusted the work and went away for a couple of months. But when he came back, he was surprised. 
that the other brother instead had constructed a bridge that connects both of them, both the houses. And of course, naturally, there was a, a beautiful understanding and love between one another. This is what is our call, the call to build the bridges. Isaiah, in the 11th chapter, beautifully speaks of his dream that he had. Dream for the kingdom of God. The wolf shall live with a lamb. The leopard shall lie down with a kind kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hold of the asp. And the weaned child shall put its hand on the arrest day. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, the waters call their sea. Brothers, I'm sure we have heard about this passage. This is what was the dream of Isaiah. And I believe this is the call that we have been given to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. The community, it's a gift and it's a grace. The grace of uh, uh, living together as brothers in Christ. And uh, of course, Saint, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Pope Francis recently uh, on the 3rd of October, 2020, at Assisi, he signed the encyclical, as we know, Fratelli Tutti, your own brothers. And he received this, uh, uh, or he writes this encyclical because he was inspired by the uh, letter or admonitions that Francis gives. This is what he starts with, brothers, my dear brothers. Uh, to all my brothers. So with that, he wants to also speak about the fraternity and the social relationship. And he emphatically asserts the fraternity and the social friendship are the ways uh, he indicates to build a new, a more just and a peaceful world. He was inspired by the abolitions. And secondly, also on 4th of February, 2019 at Abu Dhabi, he signed a document along with great Imam Al Azhar, a document called Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. This was an inspiration for him and from which he derives and where he beautifully brings out that we as a human family, we form a human family that we live together and what are the ways and means that we can uh, follow to build up a just, peaceful, loving community or family. That's an invitation that our Pope gives to us. And uh, of course, there are different kinds of community. Community by crisis. Maybe when there are difficulties, problems, people come together, especially like uh, uh, when there was tsunami, people came together to help one another. Or community by accident. People, when they go for pilgrims or when they work in an institution, uh, it's by an accident that they work together or go as a group. Afterwards, you see this no more a community. Community of choice. Certain people choose to live in a community. And there is uh, finally the community of uh, love and faith. I believe ours is a community of uh, love and faith. That's what our Father Francis also says. The brothers born of flesh love each other. How much more should we love our brothers born of the spirit? So we are uh, bonded together, not only in our baptism, as St. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, chapter 12, verses, verse 13, for uh, in one spirit, we were baptized into one body. That's by baptism. Of course, again, he says, uh, the Eucharist also brings us together in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, he speaks of that. And of course, he also further in Romans 12, 4, uh, he speaks about though we are many, uh, we are one in the body of Christ. So these are all the concepts that uh, uh, St. Paul is trying to insist about our communion or uh, to live like brothers. But much more, Francis 
uh, he speaks about the call that we have been given, the call to live as brothers because of our charism, because of the religious life, because of the profession that we have given, we are living as brothers and that we live as a community. Now, there are three stages of community building. We build up our community. Uh, of course, every three years when we have transfers, when we have a new provincial team, there is a change or transfer and we come together and we form a community. There are three stages. The first one is initial community. The second one is chaotic community. Uh, the third one is real or loving community. This is what we are called to build up, a real and loving community. But it's a process that doesn't happen overnight. But of course, when we speak about initial community, there are beautiful things. When we come together in the month of May or June after the transfers, uh, lots of favorites do. We sit together, we discuss a lot, we have lots of planning. And uh, we work together, we have a lot of uh, uh, laughter, a joyfulness is there, we eat, we spend a lot of time together, recreation goes for a longer period of time. So there is uh, a lot of uh, positive feelings. And actually, we avoid conflicts initially. Initial power is there, beautiful, wonderful. Lots of dreams, plans for the community, for the parish, for the schools or different kinds of ministry that we may have. And now, slowly, it, as times go by, depends, the chaotic community. Naturally, we end up somewhere where uh, the animal instincts emerge when there are problems, when there are difficulties, when there are misunderstandings. Naturally, each one, uh, the animal instinct emerges, and there is defense mechanism. We try to defend ourselves by all means. And there is a power struggle. Who is the greatest? The guardian, the parish priest, the principal, or whatever, who is the greatest. So this natural uh, struggle uh, emerges. And now, this is normal to happen. We can avoid the naturally our negative self, our animal instincts emerge and we have misunderstanding, we fight, we defend one another, uh, and uh, there is a struggle. And now the third one is a natural one is the real or loving community. But it's beautiful if we can end up with uh, being a real or loving community. But there is also a danger that we can end up as a pseudo community, a false community, or a real or loving community. Uh, what about this pseudo community? Pseudo community can have the expression of uh, fighting, constantly fighting with one another, or fleeing from one another. We don't want to meet one another. We, uh, uh, I mean, uh, at different times we come uh, and have our meal, or we don't go for prayer, we don't want to meet one another together. So we flee the presence of the other. Or the frozen community, frozen community, no activity at all. It's like uh, uh, a body, a hostel where we live together and uh, we have our own business, our own work, and we uh, disperse for different ministries. Maybe only for testing, voting, for eating, we uh, stay there in the community. It's a frozen community, no life at all. No prayer, no recreation, no activity, but just the minimum. So that's a pseudo community. But whereas the real are loving community, that's what is our ideal, the goal that we need to work together to establish in our communities, the cooperation, the mutual support. The teamwork. Of course, there is a healthy boundary, uh, fighting, uh, misunderstanding maybe there. We clarify, we uh, uh, try to restore our, our friendship, our relationship. Uh, we respect each other's boundaries. Each one's department is there, work is there. We don't interfere unnecessarily. And we live together uh, for the mission to work together. Mission oriented. Much more, much more. We are together, living together to witness as brothers. That's the fabulous call that has been given to us, that we live here on earth as brothers, uh, of spirit, okay, who can live together with all differences, but still we love and enjoy the relationship of one another. So that's the witnessing value that, for which we are called.
And now, in order to establish or in order to build up our communities, uh, Dr. Gary Chapman, uh, he has written a book called uh, The Love Languages. I'd like to just to share some of the ideas from his uh, uh, or some of the ways or languages of love through which we can establish, we can build up our communities, the languages of love. There are five languages. Of course, this is one of the languages of love of the King Shah Jagan to his wife, Umtaj. And uh, in First Corinthians chapter 13, verses uh, uh, 1 to 3, we have a beautiful passage of St. Paul. Uh, if I speak in the tongues of mortals of, or, and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. I give away all my possessions. If I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So once again, this is the invitation from uh, uh, St. Paul, the beautiful passage speaking about love. The five kinds of uh, love, languages of love. The first one is the words of affirmation. It's beautiful. To affirm one another, uh, to encourage one another, to speak something positive about the other. This words of affirmation naturally builds up the community. Uh, I remember uh, some years back uh, when I was in uh, Rameshwaram, the college, uh, Polytechnic College, you know, we have a cook, uh, Miriamma, and she's there for so many years. And uh, uh, naturally she used to get irritated sometimes for no reason, she'll be shouting and yelling. And in the kitchen, she'll be simply shouting. So when we go for washing the dishes, sometimes I used to tell her, um, Ma, Nathan, and the mean brahma chumming, they are super, super taste, ma. Uh, immediately, when we say that, those words, her, uh, that uh, tension goes down so much, she says, Pongasami, finished. She's cool, like a cuckoo bird. She was so tense, angry, but one single word of appreciation, affirmation, brings down her tone and she's uh, happy. So, of course, the words of affirmation, encouraging one another. I'm sure we have lots of gifts. There are so many goods in each one of us. And uh, it's easy to find out the beautiful things our brothers do and that we can affirm one another. We can encourage one another. Of course, if not we, who is going to affirm the other? Uh, well then, good and faithful servant, Matthew 25, 21. And another author, Mark Twain, says, I can live for two months on a good compliment. On a good compliment. There was a teacher, and this teacher came to the class, and uh, she had a tank, uh, a tank of her, uh, I mean, the badges, which contained the words, you are precious, you are precious. And she pinned this tank on the shirts of each student. And she also said something beautiful about each student. She gave extra on time. And she said, this is a project for you. Take this, you can go anywhere and give to anybody, either your family member or your friends or anybody. You give and affirm them and see the reaction, what happens to them and come and report. So naturally the students were enthusiastic. They went to different places. A boy went to uh, a neighboring company where he met the manager and said, so you are very precious. You helped me in my project and I was able to score higher marks. I'm really thankful to you. You are very precious to me. Thank you so much. He printed. And that manager took it to his high official and then he told him, so you are a great, uh, uh, one of the great uh, administrative genius, he said. The, the, that high official was taken aback. He said, are you too? Or, I mean, are you sincere in saying this? He said, yes. I mean it. So though you get irritated, but you see that you get the jobs done. You have that capacity. You are an administrator, a good administrator, he said. That high official, as he was traveling back home, he was thinking, to whom will he give this tank? He said, he'll give to his son. So when he went, the son was there in the hall. So he said, my son, you are very precious. I love you so much. Next to your mother, you are so important to me. I love you so much, he said. And the boy started shedding tears. 
dad embraced him and asked, hey, what's happening to you? Why do you weep? And the son said, dad, all these years, I've never experienced your love. You and mom never cared for me. You are not there for me. You don't say anything good. Whenever you meet me, whenever you see me, always you complain. You always find fault with me. And I hate living. I decided to die. But I don't think after you spoke to me now, I don't think I should die. I want to live. Dad, dad ran to his house, uh, room, that boy's room, and he found a letter where he had written that he wanted to kill himself because he never found the love of the father. Those words, beautiful words of affirmation of the father saved the life of the boy. Yes, my dear brothers, the words of affirmation. We can encourage our own brothers. We can give to our own brothers beautiful things. This is what their father teaches her daughter, how to affirm herself and others. A really good day. You can be positive. Say, I am strong. I am strong. Say, I am smart. I am smart. Say, I work hard. I work hard. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am respectful. I am respectful. Yeah. Say, I'm not better than anyone. I'm not better than anyone. Nobody's better than me. No one's better than me. I am amazing. I am amazing. I am great. I am great. What's your name? Aaliyah Austin. If you fall? I get back up. What are you? I'm last. You're right, you're five. Words of motivation. Yes. This is a beautiful thing that a father can teach his uh, own daughter to speak something beautiful, positive about herself. And actually, when she is able to affirm herself, uh, she'll be able to affirm others. It's basically when she has got good self-confidence, self-esteem about herself, that she's a wonderful girl, a beautiful girl, that she's strong, that she's blessed. Naturally, she'll see everybody as blessed people, good people, and wonderful people in her life. That's a beautiful gift a father can give to her daughter. So also, we brothers can do wonderful things. Uh, maybe as an exercise, uh, you could write about your own community members, maybe two, three, or five a day. Just write a few words and hand on to the brothers. You can see what a difference that can make in our communities. The second language of love is the presence. To be with to be with. Of course, this is a wonderful gift. Today, many families suffer because people are not there in their lives. The spouses are not there for them. And of course, each one is busy. Children are not there for the parents. Parents are not there for children. I know in a family in Bangalore, and this family is, of course, only one daughter and a wonderful family, a lovely family, but the father and the mother are too busy. On a birthday, on her birthday, daughter's birthday, dad gave her some 10,000 rupees. Of course, morning they had cake cutting and so on. And he gave her 10,000 and said, hey, enjoy your day. I'm sorry, I can't be there. You can go with your friends, have dinner, et cetera, et cetera. And father went away to his business. Mother went away for her own business. Now the girl is alone, all alone. And of course, with her friends, she celebrates her birthday. And of course, not with the family. That's what she would expect. She would love to have the family with her on her birthday, but only daughter, but for what are they running? To save money, to earn money for her daughter, for their daughter, for what? If the presence of the parents are not there. This is what happens. Many families even today break because the other person is not there. And now with the gadgets, uh, of course, uh, they go for work and they come back and each one is busy with his uh, mobile or uh, with TV or whatever gadgets that is available. And of course, they are not present to one another. This can also, of course, can happen to any of us. Sometimes it can happen in some of the communities where TV is there, even in the refectory. 
So we watch TV and we eat. And of course, there is no communication. I don't think in any of the communities you have, but certain communities I have seen where, especially in the sisters communities, where they have TV and all the time they are busy watching rather than dialoguing with one another. This is an escapism. So we need not meet one another. We need not talk to one another. We are busy watching the TV and so on. So this is what happens. The presence to be with, to stay with the other. And of course, uh, Jesus himself says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them, Matthew 18, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the ages. This is a beautiful promise that Jesus gives to each one of us, his presence with us. And of course, we are called to be present to one another, to spend time together, the quality time. Of course, we have our own uh, morning. Uh, we come together for prayer, uh, for meals and recreation. That's beautiful. Even in the times of difficulties that we can be present to one another, that we can enjoy the presence of the other, to feel, yes, I have my brother with me who can stay by my side. And uh, this particularly, this picture I uh, inserted for one simple reason, but of course it's a painful thing. I heard once a father was telling, he has got only one daughter. And when I was dialoguing, I said, why not do you have more children? Of course, he's a rich man. And he said, why father? What's the need? I have one daughter that's enough for me. But what about your uh, daughter needs a company? So how long are you going to be there? After you are gone, she will say, at least I, my brother is there for me, my sister is there for me. But now she has nobody. Of course, she may have her own family, but no blood relationship, no brother or sister. No, why should I have, a, uh, have more children? I have a dog and she's so friendly with the dog. They are like a brother and sister and they enjoy one another's presence. And uh, you see, I was really pained to hear what he said afterwards. You see, I have to spend very little on my dog. Okay, maybe the dog is alive for 10 years. Afterwards, it's dead and gone. I can get another dog. I need not educate the dog. I need not uh, look after uh, of, uh, accumulating property for my dog, or I need not uh, have uh, uh, anything else, or give the dog in marriage, or spend on the, the dog, etc. But just one daughter, I can spend on her, I can accumulate my wealth for her. So this is the words of a father. So I just have my dog and that's enough for my daughter. So of course, this is not in our case, in our communities. We have our own brothers. We live together, we, we enjoy, uh, we are called to enjoy the presence of one another. This is a beautiful uh, video that we can watch uh, I mean, the different kinds of parents, I mean, different parents were uh, invited and they had uh, asked a question, if you had to have a dinner with someone, with whom would you like to have? And all of them, to, uh, all different parents, they said, uh, they said the names of great guys, uh, some celebrities. But whereas when children were asked the same question, of course, they didn't know the parents were present, but let's see what the children like. If you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, who would you choose? Kylie Minogue. Oh. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. Oh God, I wouldn't have a clue. I know, straight up. Yeah. Paul Hogan. Kim Kardashian. No, no, no. I'd like to have dinner with Justin Bieber. <laughs> what? He's not coming to my house. No, um... <laughs> I'd have Bob Hawke. Dave Hughes. Barry Humphreys. Jimi Hendrix. People who have made a difference in the world, maybe Nelson Mandela at the dinner table. I don't know what he's going to say, I'm scared. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, oh. who would you choose? Probably our whole family, like a whole extended family. Mum and Dad. <sighs> Mum and Dad. Does it have to be a celebrity? Could it be family? We love it. We talk about how school is. We ask mum and dad how their day was. Family. Yeah, mum and dad. Family. Who would you guys like to have dinner with? They just want to be with us mm. while they're eating food, which is pretty cool. 
they see us above everything. I'm gonna get. Yeah. Yeah. Bit of, bit of a message in it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, the spending time with the family, to be with the family, the presence of one another, enjoying the presence of one another. That's a beautiful message from the children, where they desire to have the family rather than great people, personalities or celebrities uh, whom they would like to have with them for their dinner. Third love language, acts of service. It's beautiful, acts of service. And that's what we are called for, to serve one another. And we are religious, are priests, to serve, to be of great service to the others. I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also must wash one another's feet. Washing the feet, that's the example that Jesus has set for us, John 13, 12 to 15. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28, Acts of Service. Uh, a few years back, uh, when I was in Nagarquil, I used to go to, uh, to a convent that's near Kolachal called Pergasaburam. And uh, in, in that con Holy Cross convent, I used to go there for confessions and so on. And once a sister had taken me to a family, to visit the family. There I found a man, young man, Joseph, who was bedridden. He was working in Kuwait for some years, and uh, after marriage, he went, he was working. Once he was driving uh, during the work time, and he met with a, a major accident, and his spinal cord was affected, and uh, below his chest, his whole body was benumbed. He could not move about, no sensation at all. He was bedridden. The doctors could not treat him. They said nothing can be done. He has to lie down like this for his life. So now the man came back. The man came back. Believing that his uh, uh, wife's family would take care of him. Above the father-in-law's house, he built a house and he was staying there, uh, trusting that the father-in-law would take care of him. But that father-in-law was so good, he called his daughter one day and said to her, hey, look, why do you want to stay with that man? He's useless. He's a waste. Why do you want to stay with him? Come away. I'll find another man for you in, uh, to get in marriage, get into marriage. And that lady was uh, shocked and uh, she was angry and said to the father, Dad, you're my father or my uncle. I, need, I don't expect these words from you. I promised to him and to the, uh, I mean, to God, in the presence of everybody, that I'll be faithful to him, both in sickness and in health. How can I leave him? Though she was married for a few years and they, don't, they didn't have children, but still she was so firm in saying, I'm committed to him, lifelong commitment. I can't leave him. So they moved away and they came and constructed another house over his own brother's house, Joseph's brother's house. And there I met him. This man was uh, better than completely. And that lady, I found her so joyful, so joyful she was. She never complained about the husband, but at least this man used to stay, was whining and he was telling, see this, uh, my wife, she can't hear, I have to shout, but she's an angel. She takes care of me very well. I said, after me, she can marry anybody. So that's what he said. And now, even now, after so many years, I heard that they are together, that this lady is taking care of him, along with his brother. So she is taking care of him. That's the service, act of service. I, I, I think at least 20, 25 years are over now. Even now I hear that they are together. That's beautiful service for which we are called for, the acts of service. And uh, uh, there was a millionaire also, a millionaire, but of course he never found peace, happiness. He accumulated wealth, he bought land, he was doing business and his uh, wealth, he increased his wealth, but he never found happiness. One day one of his friends came to his house and said, hey, look, why not we do something? Come on, I'll take you to your home. There, the children were there. Many of them were handicapped. And he said, why not we buy a cycle, tricycle for these children so that they can move around. And uh, he gave, he bought and gave those children. And those children started moving around. Seeing this, that man was extremely happy. 
the joy of giving, sharing, serving one another. That's that's what builds up the community. Builds up the So we have seen three languages of love. Uh, the words of affirmation, presence, acts of service. And the fourth one is tokens of love. It's nothing but giving gifts. All of us like to receive gifts. We receive gifts, we give gifts to others, to our loved ones, our friends, our family members. That's beautiful. But of course, this giving gifts can establish love, beautiful relationship and it can increase the happiness of the family giving gifts to one another i remember some years back one lady from Guayamutu was calling me and she was weeping one day i said i said what makes you to weep and this lady said father today is my birthday and my family whole family members they forgot they did not remember that it was my birthday my daughters and my husband they forgot about it Every time when they celebrate the birthday, I am very particular. Meticulously, I prepare. I buy gifts for them, cake for them. At middle of the night, I wake them up and say, come on, cut the cake, give the gifts and so on. I used to do. But now, I was also expecting, uh, pretending to be sleeping. I was lying down there. At 12 o'clock, nobody woke me up. And uh, till 12 o'clock, I was awake and I was weeping and that they had forgotten. Early morning, I got up and I was sitting again thinking that someone would remember to greet me, to wish me, but nobody remembered. My husband was asking me, hey, did you not prepare breakfast? I said, no, we are, I'm not preparing. I'm not feeling well. So he said, okay, we'll go to the hotel restaurant, we'll eat and we'll go for work. So everybody dispersed. My husband went for work, I came to the school, my children went to school, and now they are forgotten. I'm wearing a new sari, everybody was asking me, hey, it looks great. Is it uh, bought for, by your husband? I said, yes. But it's not true. Afterwards, I was weeping because it was given by my sister. So the very fact that they forgot the birthday of this lady made her so, so, so sad. It's, it's not what the family would give her, but rather that the family remembered her. Remembered her beautiful day, the birthday, and bought something. I mean, even for hundred. She says, even for 100 rupees, if I had given a sari, I would have been happy that I have been, have been very happy. But they completely forgot about it. Tokens of love. The wages of sin is dead. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift. Tokens of love. Isn't it an interesting video about a little girl? Who receives our birthday presents? Hey Lily, do you want to open a birthday present early? Yeah. You do? Okay, go sit on the couch. Yeah. Is your birthday coming? Yeah. Okay. So just open that backpack. No, no, just open it. Just look what's in there. Well, what's in there? Pull the stuff out. I got a movie. How do you know I want this, Mom? Yeah. What else? I got another movie. 
I'm sure I won this. I how? didn't. How? I just didn't. Mommy, how? Pajamas. Ooh. What kind are those? Um, there's a monster. I mean, Minnie Mouse. Minnie Mouse. What else is in there? Pajama pants. <gasps> wow! Oh, I see. Do you remember? Show me. What does it say? What else is in there? Snacks? What else is in here? More snacks? That's it. Where do you think we should take all this stuff? Where do you want to go with it? Right where do you want to go with it? Um, you could go anywhere. Where would you want to go? Disneyland. Why don't we go? Okay, let's go. Now. No. Today. Yeah. I'm being ser I'm being serious. We going? We're leaving today to go to Disneyland. Are you joking? No, I'm not joking. Are we going? Yes, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> Are you excited? <laughs> it's for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> it's my birthday today. No, in a week, but we're going. I'm crying too! I'm crying too! You excited? You got it hugs! That's interesting. The girl is so excited. The gifts that she has received. Of course, naturally. Giving gifts excites people. People are happy to receive gifts. That can enhance the love of the community. The last one is touch. Touch can do miracles. Of course, Jesus healed people by his touch. The lepers, the sick people, even the lady who had the hemorrhage, she touched the cloth of Jesus and she believed by touching it should be healed and she was healed instantly the healing touch of jesus and of course we our touch also can heal people that's why we give blessings all the beautiful positive vibes come to the hand and we bless people and uh, naturally our beautiful blessings can create uh, wonderful things in the lives of the people touch can heal the touch gentle touch loving touch the caring touch for one another. It's not necessarily even physical touch, even emotional touch. The emotional approach, the kindness or gentleness with which we can approach others can touch the lives of others who long to be loved, to expect the love of the other, the touch, the gentle touch. Yes. There was uh, something happened a few years back in a hospital in New York, where uh, twin children were born and they were premature babies and they were kept in incubators. And uh, one of the babies was dying. So the nurse was there in that hospital. She took that dying baby and put with the other healthy baby, which was never in the practice at that time. And uh, the moment the baby, the sick baby came to her bed, the, naturally, this little girl, little girl, extended her hand, the healthy child, and put on her shoulder. What a beautiful thing it was. It was a miracle that that gentle touch of that girl revived the life of the child. That's a beautiful. And of course, they are grown up children now. They are grown up like uh, in their teens or young adulthood. And that touch of that day, gave life to those girls, especially to the one who was dying. Here there is another example. Again, the touch of the mother revived the life of a child.
Back now at 810 with an incredible story about a mother who revived her newborn son after being told that he would not make it. Well, the family is here this morning for an exclusive interview. But first, today, national correspondent Amy Robach has their remarkable story. Amy, good morning. And good morning to you. Doctors told Kate and David Ogg of Sydney, Australia, their baby boy was dead. But what happened was next was nothing short of a medical miracle. The birth of a baby, one of life's happiest moments. But for Kate and David, it's clinically dead. Doctors told her. I said, Jamie didn't make it. We've lost him. The nurse handed the baby's limp body to his parents to say goodbye. But instead, the mother talked to her newborn when she could have been warning him. This footage taken by her midwife. Jamie lay on his mother skin to skin for two hours. She cuddled him and stroked him and said, your twin sister Emily is fine. He started gasping more and more regularly. I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? She says the doctors told her not to get her hopes up. It's just a reflex. He can't be alive. Then um, a short time later, he opened his eyes. Kate put breast milk on her finger, held it at Jamie's lips, and he started sucking. Her doctors were in shock. He just kept shaking his head and moving it around. I don't believe it, I don't believe it. A medical miracle. Baby Jamie came back to life before. So a touch of the mother revived the life of the child. That's beautiful. That's the greatest gift of touch. That's the wonder that a touch can give. Now we have seen five love languages. The words of affirmation, the presence, acts of service, tokens of love, or gift giving, and finally touch. Now, the question is, what's your love language? It's good to know what's my love language. Now, how to know the love language of others, especially our brothers in the community? First thing is to know what is my love language, and now also to know what are the love languages of my community members. Observe the love language others use. How to identify, first observe, how they approach you, how they come across to you. Maybe one brother is affirming all the time, saying something beautiful about the others. That means he wants to be affirmed. That's the indication. He wants to be affirmed. Or your brother brings lots of gifts to others and shares with others. Naturally, that means he also wants to receive gifts from the other. Or if suppose he's uh, uh, spending a lot of time together, having fun with the others, presence, he wants to have that presence. So observe the love language of others. Use. Number two, what does the other complain about? This complain also, in the family sometimes the uh, uh, spouses complain, no? you never spend time with me. That means the spouse is expecting that the other spends time with the person. So the complaints also can give a communication than what the person expects, what the community members complain about. Now, if you can know the love language of others, naturally, we can build up a wonderful community. We can establish a beautiful community. And now, again, the words of uh, St. Paul, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Does not insist on its own, own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, the same thing, we shall uh, replace love with the word I. And let's read it. I'm patient. I'm kind. I'm not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. I do not insist on my own way. I'm not irritable or resentful. I do not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoice in the truth. I bear all things, believe all things, and uh, hold all things, and love, uh, sorry, endure all things, hope all things, and endure all things. That's beautiful. Dear brothers, this is the love that for which we have been called to live, to share, and to enjoy the presence of one another. Thank you so much, brothers and wish you all the best a fruitful retreat. God bless you, brothers. Thank you for the opportunity you have given.
to share our PhD. Thank you.